Okay, so fasten the seat belts. Uh, I want to start with a personal story of mine, which is both about Poland and about loneliness. So once, I, I think it was six years ago, um, I went on a honeymoon with my wife. And we planned to go from Estonia to Croatia by car. And so, um, so which meant that we had to go through Poland. And um, every single friend or relative whom we shared this information would give us this scared look and say that you want to go for Poland? <laughs> no, you don't want to go for Poland. You're going to get killed, robbed uh, in Poland. And of course, the stories come from the early 90s where there's a lot of criminality across the border. So I got scared, but I had to go. So I got myself a pepper gas spray. <laughs> So you can imagine how lovely a picture a couple is going on a honeymoon with a pepper gas spray. <laughs> and I remember that when we went, uh, when we were in Warsaw, I, I remember uh, I was in a hotel room watching the city from the 10th floor and suddenly having this sense of a tremendous uh, gratitude and, and feeling like everything is at its place and I have a place under the sun. And it took me actually a while to understand that um, the reason why this moment was so special for me was not only because none of those bad things ever happened. We enjoyed the, you know, the highway, we enjoyed the Warsaw, we enjoyed the Krakow. But also that um, with this one positive experience of mine, the, all of the other negative experience was outweighed. So I sort of exchanged other people's negative experience towards my own positive one. Okay, so now you'll probably understand why the story is about Poland, but why is it about loneliness? So to, to get answer to that, you'll have to listen to the end. And I'll go back to the question of development. So when, uh, when do you think uh, kids uh, are able developmentally to get the experience of loneliness? Uh, one, three, five, what, what would you offer? Three. So, well, the truth is that we actually we don't know because infants don't speak to us, and toddlers don't make a very good companion for research. So, most of the uh, research that I have found, they deal with the kids at approximately uh, five years of age. Um, but I tend to think that that's not uh, the you know the reason is obviously because it's when you can measure it. But I tend to think that that's exactly the age where the loneliness becomes developmentally available as an experience. And now I'm going to try to explain that. So there are a few reasons that make children of approximately five years of age um, vulnerable to the experience of loneliness. Uh, I think it was uh, Lev Vygotsky, a famous Soviet psychologist who started, who was the first to, to talk about it in the uh, 1930s. That that's the approximately age when the inner speech starts to develop, right? He, he said that the outer speech uh, develops into inner speech through what he called the negocentric speech, right? So first, kids just repeat what they heard, and then they say to themselves to self-regulate, right? And then they start to say those things inside their, their head, and that's what we call verbal thinking. But that is exactly the experience that creates the loneliness because the, uh, the child of a one, two, three, or four years of age, for a well-attuned parent, which is of course a bigger and bigger problem these days, but for a well-attuned parent, any reaction of a child is pretty uh, easily understandable in the context of the situation. But as soon as the uh, a kid is able to think, and um, he's not, no longer an open book anymore. So he'll have to express himself verbally to be understood, and that's what creates loneliness. And there are more things that happen. They are very um, sort of conformant. Uh, conformity is very high. I suppose that you've heard about this famous experiment done in the 70s where all the children are offered a, a porridge, which is, salt, uh, which is uh, sweet. And then there's a one piece that is salty, and the last one who gets the salty piece, he makes the face like that, and he still says that it's salt, it's sweet, right? Because everybody said it, right? And then they are, of course, cognitively mature enough um, to start to appreciate the experience of other people, like on the basis of their experience. They, they of course, they do, uh, they do learn from testimony much earlier, 
<laughs> but there is a difference that comes with this verbal thinking in terms of uh, learning from testimony of other people. Uh, because if you try to reason out a three-year-old uh, from having an ice cream before meal on the basis of your experience as an adult, because the sweets spoil the appetite, like if you've ever tried that, you know that that doesn't work. They break down and they, and they get angry and they protest. And at the age of five, that's the age where they want the, this, the rules, they want the regulations, and they will follow them strictly, because that's how they get an ice cream in the first place. So they are taking in uh, experience of other people as if it was their own. The things that they have never heard or seen, like, for example, the concept of bacteria, the concept of God, and stuff like that. So I would say that developmentally, kind of a normal developmental loneliness is triggered by unshared experiences and the necessity of verbalizing the context that are not obvious. Okay, so now let's jump into the adults. Oh, by the way, uh, yeah, I have never seen it in any of the other developmental psychology books, so I would have to attribute it to myself, because it seems like the Maslow hierarchy of needs applies perfectly to children, right? It's like they, the main dominant need comes to the forefront of the developmental process in certain age because there are certain things that develop that demand the need to be fulfilled. Like the, the, the infant is very helpless, so that needs the, the, the comfort to be fulfilled. And the, the toddler who is very active but, but has zero experience and not much planning ahead the safety becomes the dominant need. And then, as the, the inner uh, thinking and, and the speech develops, then the belonging and, and the communication becomes the main need. And then, as they start to compete, that's the self-esteem, and etc., until the self-actualization and questions of who am I in the world at a late adolescence. So, so it doesn't look like it would apply to adults, but it applies perfectly to kids. So it's sort of just like... A, a fetus in a worm goes through the stages of development of evolution, from the fish to the human. Uh, the, the human babies developmentally go through, through the ladder of Maslow's from 0 to 20. But I'm, I'm focusing right now on this 5 to 7 thing, uh, which is... Which, which, so the loneliness, uh, the vulnerability to loneliness puts the belonging to the forefront of the developmental process. So. But let's now jump to the adults, and the, the striking similarities that I've seen were very, I mean, I would really love to have a uh, research behind that, but I, unfortunately I don't. Um, it's all based on my experience with, I would say, six patients with phobia and five patients with OCD. But what I have seen in my practice is that uh, Clients with phobia and OCD, they would manifest very similar characteristics with the normal five-year-olds. Right? They are very high in, uh, in conformity, uh, sorry, in agreeableness, and they take the information in without much criticism, and they have tons and tons and tons of unshared experiences, whilst the normal five-year-old really struggles to share it. By the way, they become very talkative at that age. Right, as in an attempt to, to sort of speak out all of the experience that they've got. Um, and of course the adults use, see their own value mostly as being useful as a professional and, and kids just try to feed in and follow the norms of society. And both are very talkative but very superficial. So I will give you an example, but those examples are very similar to each other. Like I would have a patient with a, with a dog phobia. And I would ask him, uh, can you tell me about some kind of experience uh, uh, with the dogs, the negative experience that you have had, that would make this kind of reaction uh, understandable? And he would say, oh yeah, I have a plenty of experience, so tell me. Okay, so he would say, well, my father once got attacked by a dog in the army, and he got beaten in the neck, and I see the scar was that big, and, and it was really awful. So I'd say, wait a minute, that's not your experience. And then the patient would go like, but wait, but if, if it happened to him, it could happen to anyone. Mm -hmm. So listen to that. That's a perfect logic for a five-year-old, right? Or the other one, well, let's talk about OCD a little bit. Um, I have a few patients who have problems with sexual life. 
And they are different between them because there are some patients who are severely traumatized and that would manifest later as a kind of a sex addiction thing. But then there are also those who don't qualify as such, and, and, but they would still have problems with compulsions around porn. So one of my clients uh, who would come to me with the problems with intimate life, because, you know, that life is boring, uh, because my wife doesn't want to do what we see in porn. So I would ask him, like, how, how come did he get uh, hooked up on such, such an amount of porn, because he would, from, from the age of 15, he would watch it every day for a few hours, and that's a lot, right? So, so he would tell me, and by the way, those stories are very similar. Uh, the mother was too strict, the boy was too shy, uh, at the age when hanging out with girls is absolute must, he didn't have the chance to do it. So the porn is an easy exit. But then again, if you think of what is porn essentially, it's tones of other people's experience, right? That you take in without critics, and that you can't get rid of later. So, what I have found to be helpful for both uh, of those groups of patients is, first of all, to get critical of experience of other people. We would deconstruct the experience of other people so it would no longer isolate them inside. Um, so, for example, the patient with the dog phobia, we would talk about his father and, and we would dig in deeper into that and we would find out that he actually went out without permission and went back to the wrong place and was going through the fence and, and didn't obey the command so he, you know, the boy, the soldier who sent the dog had no chance. So that was actually a very stupid behavior. But my patient didn't have uh, intellectual ability to question that experience uh, when, when he was presented with one. So, and for example with the patient with, with, with the porn uh, compulsion, I would ask him um, to Google on the biographies of the porn actresses to see the, what's the experience behind it. Uh, is it really that nice? Right? Uh, and he would of course see that most of the girls don't want to do it and they are, uh, and they are addicts and they are you know, traumatized severely. And I would even ask him to you know, uh, pick a particular pose that he likes from porn and then do it. And then he would see that this is actually very unnatural and very hard to do. So he would get, the idea is to get critical of the experience. And the number two is to be critical of information one gets in general. Because those people would not be very critical of information in general, except for the one that was connected to their profession. That's the place where they would have a lot of personal experience and no one could compete with that. But otherwise, it would be problematic. And by the way, I re highly recommend them a book of Clay Johnson's, which is an information diet, which is a, a very good book on that topic. And the, the next thing is, is to learn to verbalize and share experience in a ways that help other, other people distinguish what is unique and what is universal. So to, to sort of digest the experiences that one gets in, in a proper way. And one thing that also helps it is to write an autobiographical or diary notes to process the everyday life experiences. So let's get back to, to the story of pepper gas spray. Can you see how this is about loneliness? I would take other people's experience in, right, without critics. And the moment I got my personal experience, it was gone. So what I've found is that with kids and with adults it goes the opposite way. Right? Kids become vulnerable uh, to loneliness because they take experiences in. And with adults it's the other way around. They, the more lonely they are, the more they get others' experiences in, which actually perpetuates the loneliness, right? Because you can't share experience of other people. How do you do that? You never even have it but it's inside and it really sets up the music. So I'd like to finish with, you know, I argue with Henry Miller, who, who once said that words are loneliness, which isn't partly true, but I would say that the right words that are shared in the right way with right people, maybe at the right time, is actually the basis of belonging. Thank you.